So I have only put three or four words on each slide. Yeah? They're good words, but only three or four. And I've put lots of pictures. So if you say, it's so tiring listening to English, just look at the pictures. And the idea is that the words, 55 times three or four words, tell a story. And the idea is the picture tells a story. It's difficult to find the right pictures sometimes. So there are two stories. They're not always the same story. Because this is a problem with multimedia, is that we weave our stories together. And the story really is about three things. It's how knowledge is no longer contained in schools and universities. The knowledge has escaped through that window, is an out in the wider community. The internet has broken the monopoly of institutions on knowledge. And the second story is about how our changes in technology, especially the move from Web 1 to Web 2, have allowed us all to become creators, not just consumers, but creators, and that we have to move in the way we teach from saying teachers have all the knowledge and we will create all the learning materials and we will create your learning environment. You will come to us if it is a classroom or you will come to us if it is our Moodle or our Blackboard or an online environment. We will tell you what to do and we have to start a process of co-creating and sharing ideas and knowledge together using technology. And that is hard. It is difficult because it's a new way for us to think about knowledge. It's a new way for us to think about teaching and learning. And it's a new way for us to te think about how we use technology and teaching resources. So that's the story, OK? Now, really, I need some music. I haven't got any music. You should have a bit of music now for a little light relief. Let's start the pictures. OK, this is going to go. I will try to not talk too fast, but the slides will go quite fast, because right? there's 55 of them. <laughs> Wait a moment. Let me, get me clock. Let me take my clock to see how long I'm taking. Can someone tell me when I've got, say, 10 minutes left? And then I should go really fast. <laughs> Petra Kucha. Yes, here we go. Okay. Point one, our societies are changing, yeah? Technologies are changing pretty much every aspect of the way we live, including work, production, how we live, yeah? Everything's changing. We can get through these fastly. And changing especially the ways we communicate. Ten years ago, the way we use mobile phones and text messages would have been a science fiction film. I don't know if any of you have seen Star Trek. Yeah? Beam me up, Scotty. Well, we haven't got the beaming up bit yet, but we've got all the other technologies they put in there as uh, futuristic ideas. And, of course, it's leading to a very difficult new idea of digital identity that we pretty much all of us now have a digital identity, which I guess relates in some ways to a lesser or greater extent to our real identities. Most of us have got embarrassing pictures in Facebook now. And those that don't will probably get them soon. Uh, and it's a big issue. We don't know how to handle those digital identities properly. But it's not just us grown-ups that have digital identities. I don't know a lot about parenting, I'll admit. So this is the little bit, apart from having a 27-year-old daughter, so I suppose I must know something, but uh, 
these are a few slides I've got about parenting and technology. The average digital birth of children today happens at six months. The average child has a digital presence at the age of six months. If that's the average one, then you can imagine the age of presence of some of them. In fact, I've seen some examples in Facebook of pregnant women publishing prenatal scans. So I guess the average age for those is about minus three months. Makes the mathematics complicated. It's true. Ooh. Parents are building the footprints, as it says there, from birth or even from birth. Uh, and this was a paper, an actual scientific paper about online, the average age of online. So, 81% of children under the age of two have got a digital footprint. I mean, who's determining their digital identity, of course, is an interesting question. So, I mean, this is, this is a huge change in our society. And, of course, that change is happening in the way we learn. Of course, it's open myth now. Every child now can hold every flat uh, object to their ear and say, hola, into a flat object. They learn to do that, yeah? But children also, there's a wonderful video. I couldn't find it yesterday because I ran out of connectivity. There's a wonderful video somewhere on the internet of this small baby sitting on the ground looking at a magazine. And the baby goes... <laughs> wonderful bit. But then the most wonderful bit, you see this baby thinking. Digital tool failure, and the baby goes. <laughs> Superb debugging. Trying to debug the tool. So they assume that a magazine is an iPad. Yeah? And that is for kids growing up today, their whole cognitive idea of what images are are that images can be moved by this. Uh, and I mean, it's changing things. It changes the way we learn, totally. And it's, so it's not so much that we have the technology, but it's the way we use the technology. And that's actually threatening our existing education system. I'll go further. I think our school system is actually becoming redundant. It's in danger that kids in the future will see it as irrelevant. The way we are trying to teach them is irrelevant to the way they live, to the way they communicate, and to the way they learn. So learning is changing. This is actually quite interesting. These pictures are of children from, yeah, are of the kids of a Canadian researcher called Alec Caruso. And he's been sort of digitally recording his kids since they were born as part of a project to see how children learn. And we're sort of working on him and trying to get some more of this stuff. But it's the whole thing, consumption, remix, produce. Ooh, I don't know what the fourth one is. I've lost my label. Never mind. But the whole thing of kids are using the stuff not just for consuming it, but for mixing and for producing themselves, digital cameras. Use of digital cameras for producing images. You've got small kids do it. I mean, I work, my main work is in the use of technology for work based learning. But my colleague, Jenny Hughes, works increasingly with primary schools and nursery schools. And so sometimes I go with her. And it's wonderful the things they're doing with technology. There's one I really like where they crawl along the ground and pretend they're a bug using a sort of small video camera. So they pretend they're a little insect and crawl on the ground to get ideas about perspective of different things. And some great fun lessons that they're using the technology for. And of course, we're using it for networking and collaboration. And I guess it's changing research, actually, the fact that you can network and collaborate with people anywhere around the world. I work for a company called Pontodusky. Does anyone know what Pontodusky means in Welsh? Any Welsh speakers here? No? Amazing. 
Well, Ponte Deski in Welsh means the bridge for learning, the bridge to learning. So Pont, Latin bridge. Uh, Dusky is the Welsh word for teaching and for learning. But it's a limited company, and we registered it at the company's registration house, and they spelt it wrong. Instead of a D, they spelt it with a G and said Ponte Gusky, not Ponte Dusky. Okay, not a big problem, but Ponte Gusky means the bridge to sleep. <laughs> so we thought about leaving it the same. <laughs> Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, there's, there's seven of us employed. There's, um, there's one person in Paderborn in Germany. There's two of us in Bremen in Germany. There's two people in Pontypridd in Wales. And we have one person working us for Thessaloniki in Greece. And we use Dropbox. We use Skype. We use email. We never actually took a decision about what tools we would use. We never said this is the company policy. We adapt things to use it where they were. And I suggest that will be the future of networks of collaboration for research, for actual economy, linked together, using different tools and putting it together. Um, and we can sort of say that in this way, this use of things is changing to what I call in learning 2.0. Part of learning 2.0 is reuse. And you'll see a whole series of slides down here which say Steve Wheeler, 2012 Plymouth University. That's because they come from a presentation by him and I am reusing them. Perfectly legally because they're under the Creative Commons license and I'm acknowledging his reuse. So we're remixing, we're using user-generated content, networking, tagging, collaborating, sharing tools. But this is a big change. This is a big change. This is no longer us, the teachers, giving the knowledge to the students, to the learners. So that's forming a collaborative form of learning. And we're really fascinated. I was really totally tired last night, I 16 hours traveling and then got into a really interesting discussion. I was like, I really want to keep awake to participate. And I'll tell you a little about that discussion in a moment, because I think it's some of the key issues we, we, we covered last night. One of the big things, perfectly on cue really, is virtual and personal learning environments. I'll just spend two minutes talking about this. Virtual learning environments, learning management systems, Moodle, Blackboard, etc. Do you know what they are? Yeah? Have you got them in your university? Yeah? What, one do, you, what do you have here? Moodle. 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 You've got... Okay, I want to ask you a question. These things, yes, they're supposed to be for learning, yeah? For students to learn. Right. We have a problem, Houston, there is a problem. One, two, okay. testing, no. one, two, three, testing. <laughs> ah, and they just missed my main rhetorical flourish, oh dear. <laughs> that was unfortunate. Do you want to do it again? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why, if we use the internet learning in one way, do we expect students to use it in another way? And I'll tell you why. It is control. It's control, control, control. We are saying to students, you have to come to our space, which we control. We have a wall around it. We control who can access it and do what we tell you to do if you are registered properly and you have paid your money and your number matches the administration's number. 
Don't get me wrong. These systems are great for administration. They are very bad for learning. But there is something even worse in my view. We're talking here about positive parenting and the use of the internet. We're saying to parents, come to our spaces to learn. And I say, great, this is fantastic. And then when we say to them, the course is finished, you cannot learn on this space anymore. We are deleting your accounts because we need the server space. No, this is not good. This is not good at all. And so what we've been promoting instead is the idea of personal learning environments and personal learning networks, which means we support students, we support parents in developing their own use of internet spaces and tools as their personal learning environment. And we have to support them. And that could be everyday tools. It could be email. It might be a blog. It might be using Twitter. We're not saying what it is, but we're supporting them in losing it. Because they're going to have that afterwards. And then we have to work a lot harder to make sure that what other content we produce and whatever activities we want them to do can work in all their different learning environments. And I would say we have to work a bit more to make sure that we collect together their work for them to share and set up areas. But that means that personal learning environment continues after our courses. And I think that's critical. The alternative, which I'm not opposed to, is that we set up an open learning area for every citizen in Spain and the UK and Germany and provide support for life. I don't think they're going to do it in the present economic situation. But that's the only other effort. You presumably, you're, some of you here are interested in psychology, yeah? So you probably have to do something called ethics, yeah? It is not ethical to open up and expect people to use a learning environment and put materials into that learning environment if you are going to shut it down and stop access to them at the end of the course. That is not an ethical action and the equivalent to that would not be allowed if you were a psychologist or a social worker. It's just unethical for educationists to do it. So we want personal, yeah. and this is pretty, isn't it? Look. Look at that. I water my networks. I, I garden my networks. And then big trees flow. And nice rain comes down. OK. It's not as easy as that. But that's the idea. So personal learning environments, they're just a collection of tools loosely coupled for working, learning, and collaboration. And stop for commercial advert on the 8th and 9th of July. There will be the third annual Personal Learning Environments Conference at Avera in Portugal. And it's going to be absolutely fabulous. <laughs> End of advert. More music play. <laughs> and I think what we're saying is the context for learning is changing. So we have the personal learning environment, but you know when I started, I said the knowledge has gone out of that window. Learning is increasingly being embedded in different contexts of everyday life. And our task is to link up with that. We talked about that, didn't we? We're talking about the parents. What we need to do is link together our curriculum, our learning provision, to the experience of those parents embedded in their lives, not just to give them theory about parenting, but to link up and to use it. But guess what? You're quite lucky because you said yesterday you're just starting out and we don't know anything. I said you're really lucky. We've had 15 years of experience of e-learning within higher education and we've made a complete mess of it. So you can start now knowing what not to do. What we did is we set up these virtual learning environments and we encouraged staff to use them. So what they did is they uploaded their lectures onto the web. PowerPoints, but more than that, notes. Long texts. 
and then the students printed them and read them. It's not an efficient system. <laughs> it's not learning, yeah? So we got that experience. It's almost inevitable. I don't know what happened in Spain, but when they invented the motor car in the UK, they called it the horseless carriage because before you had a horse carrying a carriage. So we call things, we even name things over a technology that went before. Now look, none of you are going to go down there and say, I'm getting into my horseless carriage. People would laugh. But we still talk about a virtual classroom. It's exactly the same thing. And space for learning on the internet is not a virtual classroom any more than a motor car is a virtual, is a, a, a horse's carriage. We are looking at old paradigms and not understanding quite yet the potential for learning was these technologies bring. How many slides do you think I've got left? <laughs> I think we might have to go a bit fast. <laughs> How much time have we got left? Uh, 12 minutes. Hey. OK. Do you know what Petra Kutcher is? Any of you know what Petra Kutcher is? It's a really fun thing if any of you organize conferences. Petra Kutcher is you give people, say, three minutes or even less, and you put slides up on an auto, auto forward of 20 seconds each. So they get, to, they get to present with 20 seconds, nine, nine sides, and do, 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 or you can make it more fun by getting it to 10 seconds, or even more fun by getting people to present other people's slides. So I'm going to do Petra Kucha now, OK? So I've got 20 seconds a slide. One, two, three, go. OK. Personal learning environments form part of expanded learning environment, including out of the classroom as well as inside it. Oh, wait, 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 wait a moment, wait a moment. That's because we got the wrong, the wrong presentation there. Okay, and this is, I'm not taking this out of my time, my Petra Kucha time, right? Uh, that's the one I'm going to record later today. Uh, Okay, 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 don't panic, don't panic. Do, 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 don't panic. Okay, so this is sort of the stuff we're using in our personal learning environments. Look at the numbers using these different technologies. 850 million plus using Facebook. LinkedIn, 150 million. Two billion views of YouTube a day. This is learning materials. This is learning materials, yeah? So we've got that web too, we're going to have to catch up. We've got things like Twitter, which can be used as a library. Talking about our personal learning environments, things like Twitter, the microblogging, use a library, a street corner, a broadcast channel. We've got social tagging like Delicious, which has now gone bankrupt, so we ignore that. But we can use uh, Digo instead of Delicious as a library to build on recommendations. We've got multimedia. And in 60 seconds, plus 1,500 new blog posts are posted. All these different medias we can use as part of that personal environment, learning environment. We don't need universities to do it. We've got all kinds of broadcast media. My particular favorite is radio. And announcing the launch of the Radioactive 101 project at the radio station of disadvantaged young people in Hackney, London. Uh, all kinds of new ideas. So it's not content now. We've got lots of learning content. There is plenty of content. Content isn't the king anymore. Content is the problem, actually. Because how do you find it? How do you share it? How do you know it's the right content? How do you know if it's accurate or not? It's not a question of making content anymore. And of course, we've got all kinds of mobile medias. Thank you, before I wreck your computer. Mobile medias coming in. Most content is being created, is increasingly young people are using mobile devices for accessing the media, which is a completely new thing to think about. And we are having, we will see over the next two years the introduction of augmented reality of a mixture 
of computer-based reality and physical realities coming together. These are all future trends. And of course, we've got the use of games, increasing use of games in education. And the big thing I think will be, I love this slide, warning, this body is networked. We will, over the next two to three years, see the increasing use of what's being called natural user interfaces, where instead of using a typewriter, talk about old paradigms, instead of using a typewriter keyboard to interface with a computer, we'll start using natural ways of thinking, acting, moving. And we've seen the first of them with the Wii games machine. Many of you use the Wii? The boxing is fabulous. <laughs> Recommend it after a hard day in the office. How was your day in the office, dear? I'm just going for a boxing session on my Wii. Boom, vice chancellor, boom, boom, boom. Right. And the platform for these, don't listen to Facebook, don't listen to Apple, who are all trying to close down the richness of this. The platform is the web, which is an open platform. And we can see how the web is extending from Web 1.0, which connected information, to Web 2.0, which connected people, to what we call the semantic web, Web 0.3, connecting knowledge, and in the future, perhaps Web X.0, which will connect intelligence, hopefully. We have open source software. Open domain, we're not tied into these commercial providers anymore. Open source your university. We have open content management systems. We have open content authoring tools. And we have open educational resources, such as the, work, such as the Creative Commons license, in which your material, which I'm going to produce later, is licensed under. And such as Steve uh, issues some of these sites. But, OK, we've got the technology. As long as we're sensible and use open, linked social technologies, we've got great tools for learning. This is the hard bit. The hard bit is not the technology. The hard bit is the pedagogic approach. And here, we have to be, two words, my mantra, flexible and creative. Of course, the University of Laguna is ahead of its time. The title for this is Flexibility and Creativity. Today, uh, the EU's DG Information Society announced that its Technology Enhanced Learning Unit will in future be called Creativity. They have followed your lead. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Look, everybody, but everybody says, we're constructivist in our learning approach. Moodle founders say, Moodle is a constructivist learning environment. Bollocks. Learning, oh, my language is deteriorating. Moodle is what you make of it. It's a tool, right? Now, we have a vast difference between what people say, they say we're constructivist, and what, how they actually act, and they act as behavioralists. They say, read this and answer my question and then say, ah, it's constructivist because I asked them to do something. That's not constructivist. That's not constructivist. If you want to get constructivism, we have to start them creating their own learning materials. And this isn't a new question. Ivan Illich asked in 1969 in one of the best education books ever written, 71, called De-Schooling Society, Ivan Illich said, do we want to funnel knowledge or do we want a web of knowledge and interaction? And of course, we have an idea of communities of practice, about how people learn within communities. And our changing idea is, it is not a curriculum of experts anymore. It is not just you making the curriculum, but the community within this Web2 environment makes their own curriculum. We have an idea of proximal, proximal development, where people learn through building on previous learning and supported. It's an idea that comes from Vygotsky in the 1930s. And the big and difficult job for us is to build a scaffolds of knowledge to help people move through those stages to the higher state. And that's difficult. We don't know how to do it. It's not the same as standing in front of teaching them. It's not the same as saying, here's my notes, here's my lecture notes, read them. 
supporting that learning is tr tricky. We have ideas about informal learning and how to do that and how to use digital storytelling, which is a powerful form. Now, not us telling our story, the learners telling their story in a digital way, the stories of their lives, the stories of their experience as a tool for learning. And of course, it changes the role of teachers and learners. When we have to solve the problem of the teacher-student contradiction, in ways that learners are both simultaneously teachers and students. And I'm sorry for the misspelling on Paolo's name there, but it's a picture and I can't change it. Uh, and we have to look at blended learning, how we combine experiences in the community, experiences online, experiences in the classroom, how we mix those together and how we support how much support we give to students. Is it just that they go off and do it themselves? Is it that we're coming in and intervening? What's the mix? What's the blend that we're going to use in our provision of online learning? And we have something called a collaborative blending learning model, which is a fabulous model being developed under a WebQuest 2.0 project and would take too long for me to explain to you now, but I'll give a list of, a list of links after this, yes? And of course, we had the idea of bricolage from Levi Strauss, where we make creative and resourceful use of whatever materials are to hand. And I say that bricolage is my way of what I think we should develop learning materials. We should just use what is around, what technology is around, what materials are around creatively, and move to generating user-generated learning materials. And we have a new idea called digital content creation, whereby we've got tools where we create other people's materials. That's not plagiarism, that's being positive. So we have to change our idea of what plagiarism is and start saying this is actually positive when we create other people's materials. And we have massively open online courses, MOOCs, which once more I'll give you a link to, which are absolutely fabulous. And last of all, all this, I suppose, comes under the heading of something which is called edupunk, the idea of punk music. Oh Whilst applied, still working? Whilst applied to education, educational technology, that's a picture of edupunk pin-up kid Jim Groom from America who said, we should do it ourselves. Learners and teachers do it ourselves. We do not need experts to tell us how to do it. We do not need textbook publishers who rip us off. We publish ourselves. We do it ourselves. We use the tools. And that's called EduPunk. And I think that is the way forward for technology enhanced learning. And well done, you got through 57 slides. Yes! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.